bit glitchy, but we're running a uh, rendering engine to render something like Minecraft on a Teensy, Teensy 4.1, which is running on Arduino. Okay, so we have a an actually reasonably fast 3D rendering engine on on the TNC. I'm gonna see if I can run Minecraft. I'm just kind of running a demo program right now. It's just kind of moving the pitch of the camera. Basically, just a TNC TNC 4.1 uh, with parallel connection to an RA8875 uh, graphics chip um, that I have adapted to use VGA. So. This is not coming from my desktop or, or some other program. It's running probably at about 20 to 30 FPS. And the screen resolution that it's actually used is 400 by 300 pixels. The graphics settings, though, are for 800 by 480. It's not clearing the screen all the way, clearly. Um, I'm going to be <clears throat> seeing if I can actually get the connection to the keyboard and later a mouse to work with it so I can actually have some controls. Pretty exciting. This is kind of the basics. Um, as far as what this is actually doing, that's what I'm going to get into next. So I'm going to start by kind of going through about how fast actually is this, and then I'm going to go into how it actually works to describe why it's actually fast enough to play, but why it's you know not as fast as maybe we would want it. We have this uh, monitor open here uh, that's actually connected to the TNC, so you can see how fast it's running. Um, there's just different debug information. It's hard to see, but it's taking about seven milliseconds to draw the screen. And that's just all that does is it takes the information from the TNC and sends it to the graphics chip. That's, you know, seven milliseconds almost right there that you lost. The 3D rendering is happening on the TNC. I have all the code for that right here. The graphics chip can't do 3D graphics. It's not designed to do that. It's basically just basically handling the video output and it has some you know, functions for accelerating very simple tasks like drawing text or rectangles or whatever. So it's not helping us at all in 3D rendering. Now, if this only takes seven milliseconds, then why is the, the actual frame rate lower than 60 FPS? Well, because that's not really the bulk of the work. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unplug the chip real quick so this stops moving around. You'll see that kind of runs through and it's telling us the render time. So it's the time to render all this is almost 30 milliseconds. And that's mainly a function of the screen resolution. Lower screen resolution, faster render times. It's also a function of the complexity of the scene. Um, but really, it's, it's mostly a function of how much are you drawing. Each pixel costs time. So that's, that's mainly what this is. OK, so I've opened up this. This is a rendering uh, that was actually transferred from the TNC back before I had a graphics output. And you can see that it's covering up most of the screen with a drawn image. Every single pixel that's drawn is takes up time because as to calculate what color the pixel should be, and it needs to decide whether it's actually part of a square or not. And since the squares are not very square shaped, they're more diamond shaped, that actually is a lot of computational uh, load, you know, relatively. And then on top of that, you have the screen resolution. So this image is what? Yeah, this is a 400 by 300. So that's 400 times 300 pixels, roughly. That's basically any work it takes to do one pixel is multiplied by a very large number. Let's just see what that number is. 300 times 400. Yeah, so if we take, let's say, 10 microseconds, uh, which is 0 0.01 milliseconds, times this, if, if this is how long it takes to handle a pixel, just 10 microseconds per pixel, that costs us 1,200 milliseconds or over a second. So you're getting a less than one FPS frame rate. So in order to get 60 FPS, right? So that, that would be 16 milliseconds, by the way. That means we need to draw each pixel in less than 0.1 microseconds. That's it, that's all we've got per pixel to get 60 FPS. And of course, we're not hitting 60 FPS. But this is to describe why, um, why the rendering takes so long. And so what's interesting is the complicated math is actually the easiest math. So the complicated math is in figuring out where all, this, where all these cubes are. So if I run this actually again, complicated math is in figuring out where all these shapes should be on the screen, right? That's complicated. And it uses 
matrices and linear algebra and you know all this complicated stuff not to mention you have to decide what blocks are drawn and which aren't you have to find the blocks fast enough uh, to actually draw them so once you do that that's actually the easy part that takes probably less than a millisecond maybe three milliseconds at the most um, once you do that you actually have to fill it in and filling it in is actually the thing that takes the most time and i did not expect that going into this so that's interesting so that's kind of what's what's eating up all my time and when you add it all up uh, you see that you get, you know, 30 milliseconds plus another 7 milliseconds, roughly, to draw the entire frame. So it's a total of about 37 milliseconds, which uh, in FPS is 27 FPS. So that's what we're running on when there's things in the screen. Now, if there's less things to draw, it'll be faster. The processor I'm using, let's see the CPU speed, 600 megahertz. So um, for comparison, uh, the Arduino Uno ran at 16 megahertz, and there's other differences between them as well. Hey, look, I got another one of these. Um, but your speed boost, you know, just by frequency alone is 37 and a half times. Now, on top of that, it's complicated because they're different architectures, but on top of that, um, this processor also executes uh, two instructions per cycle every other cycle on average. So you get almost almost 60 times as much performance as an Arduino Uno, uh, which is pretty awesome. That's why I can actually render at any speed whatsoever that's reasonable. But to make things even better, these chips can overclock to a gigahertz in some cases. Depends on the chip. Um, you know, just like Intel processors can only overclock to can overclock to different amounts, and there's a silicon lottery. It's the same with these chips. Uh, some of them can go to a gigahertz, some of them can't. I've taken it there before, a lot of them can, but a lot of them can't. So there you go. Also, uh, like it says here, uh, cooling is required, and I verified that it is required. Um, these chips get hot. How does this actually work? Um, if you have worked in OpenGL, if you've programmed things in LWJGL or just in OpenGL in general, it's actually pretty much the same. So the 3D drawing is done roughly in the order of things as they're represented here. First thing technically is doing this. This is a lot to explain, so I'm not going to do it. But basically in a sentence, what it does is it takes the world in coordinates that are sort of like a graph or a grid and transforms them into screen coordinates. So that's three-dimensional uh, world coordinates to a two-dimensional screen. That's basically what this allows us to do is it figures out what the calculations would be for that. We only execute this once at the beginning of the program. I don't remember where it's calculated. You just run that once at the beginning of the program and it'll use it the rest of the time. You never need to change it unless you want to change the field of view or something. So once you have that, you can actually translate all of your coordinates into screen coordinates. And that's what this actually does. Basically takes a bunch of, a bunch of coordinates, three-dimensional coordinates, right here, and transforms them into screen coordinates. You're probably asking at this point, if you're paying a lot of attention, why is this three-dimensional coordinate? Because you can see it's a vector three, it's not a vector two. So the reason is, is that you not only have screen uh, coordinates, uh, but you also have a depth coordinate. I'll show that for you. So you have your screen here, let's say, and you know, you want to draw a cube on it, right? We understand as humans that this coordinate here, this this part of the cube here, is farther back on the screen than this coordinate here, right? These are facing us, right? This face is facing us. And then these here in the back are farther away. Now, the way the computer understands that is that every place on the screen has depth. So really, this screen, in a way, is thought of three-dimensionally. The whole vertex shader is, is transforming, you know, three-dimensional coordinates. So you have, you know, your cube, right, which is shown on the screen. And then you have, let's say, x, y, and z. Translates this, right, because the screen might not necessarily be in the same coordinate system, to this coordinate system, which is y, x, here would be z, but this is really depth, okay? And of course, if you have, you know, two cubes, 
right? Let's say there's another cube back here. This is behind this one, so it's clipped. So you want to show things that are lower in depth over the ones that are farther in depth. The effect is, is that the vertex shader is figuring out what's first. So this cube is shown over this one, right? So this cube might show right here, but all over here, this cube is projected up. And this is the screen as you see it when you look at the screen as a two-dimensional screen. That's kind of how this is working. So you end up with the three-dimensional coordinates. Pretty much describes it. This is not supposed to be a full tutorial. I mean, there's tutorials online if you really want to study this, kind of giving a brief description. But that's for depth, essentially. After that, um, you run fragment shader. You do that, that, but that's done through processing these quad fragments. So go back to this. The, you have a cube. Cube is break, broken up into quadrilaterals. Um, in real, in OpenGL, it uses triangles. I'm using quadrilaterals because I'm not drawing anything that's actually a mesh. What you wind up with is this is let's say one face, right? So this is one quadrilateral, two, three. So each one of these is its own sort of object that together make a cube. And each one of these is a vertice. So all these vertices sent to the vertex shader first, right? Because again, remember these are in 3D you know, game coordinates and the vertex shader transfers them into screen coordinates with depth and those processing the vertices. So it only cares about these vertices here. That becomes, you know, these vertices here, right? Output vertices go into here, process quad fragments. So what this is doing is basically is like, okay, now let's process the whole quad. Now that we have screen coordinates for each of the edges of the quad, we can take that quad and actually figure out what's in it. Because remember, now that it's on the screen, now that we're processing it on the screen, you know, you have pixels. So you see how there's kind of a pixel grid. I'm not gonna finish it. I'm just kind of trying to demonstrate this. So you can see the quad kind of falls into this pixel grid now. And it's not a square like, you know, you usually would draw on a screen like this. It's not like a window where it's just a perfect square. It's kind of more diamond shaped and it's rotated and it's weird. What this is doing, process quad fragments, is it's taking these vector, this vector representation of the shape and it's figuring out, okay, is this pixel on that? Well, not really. Pixel, this pixel, not really. This pixel, kind of, yeah. So we'll draw it, draw it, draw it, draw it, draw it. Yeah, all of these are on it. This one's not, 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 right? This one's not, this one's not. So it's basically checking every single pixel. And for each pixel, it's running the fragment shader because each pixel is considered a fragment. So how this would look on the screen, it would fill any pixels that you know matched. You can see it's not perfect, right? Like certain areas are kind of left out. Um, and also I'm doing this on a very imperfect medium here. <laughs> but you can kind of see how it starts to form a square. And that's essentially how these games are drawing. Uh, any, any 3D game is, is doing something like this, right? So there you go. And you can see uh, how it's just this pixelated sort of shape here. But that's not the other. Th that, that's not the only thing that we're kind of doing. We're also, hopefully, that sort of makes sense. So each pixel is a fragment, right? That's why we call it the fragment shader, and it's called a fragment because it's it's only a portion of the whole shape, right? It's not the actual whole shape. It's just one pixel of that shape, and you need to pick process each pixel individually to understand both that pixel's uh, color and whether it's a part of the shape and its depth. How far deep is it? And the reason you need to know about the depth is because you may have a shape behind it. So you have this other shape that's behind it. You want to make sure that you render this square, even if this square is rendered first. You don't want the fragments that are a part of this shape to interfere. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go super deep into this. There's plenty of tutorials online where you can study vertex shaders and fragment shaders and stuff like this. Um, and depth buffers, depth buffer is another thing um, to look at. So now that we're here, now that we have, okay, we know which pixels are a part of what shapes and we know how far away those pixels are from the screen, quote unquote, from the character, like whether, what should be drawn first. Now we can move on to the actual fragment shader. Okay, um, go here. Yeah, here's the process quad fragments function. 
Uh, there's a bunch of complicated math in here, mostly. Um, I'll admit that I used ChatGPT to help with some of it, although ChatGPT had a really hard time figuring that one out. Uh, but it is beyond my understanding of mathematics, to be entirely honest. Um, anyway, so processing the quad fragments. But the, the one thing I will go over as part of this function is here we're calling the fragment shader. And we get basically the main thing you need to be aware of in here is to get the texture coordinates. So each one of these quads has coordinates associated with the texture. And that just allows us to rotate the texture onto this quad so that we don't just draw the quad, quad rotated, but also the texture. You have to rotate both of them. <laughs> and it's very easy to mess up one or the other, um, while the other one is perfectly fine. So once you figure out the texture coordinates, um, we can figure out which pixel of the texture we actually care about. So this is texture data. So in our, our Minecraft example, that's terrain.png. So you get this pixel and you pass it into the fragment shader. And of course, the uh, coordinates of the pixel that we're, we care about. And then the depth. So we have the depth and where to draw it. So this is display, right? Obviously, we want to draw it on the screen. It's not very helpful to draw it to, I don't know, an imaginary canvas. Um, so fragment shader raw. So we end up here. There's a bunch of optimizations in here just to make it go a little bit faster uh, because it is critical code. Like I said, it, you know, you want it to execute in less than you know, a fraction of a microsecond. So this is the depth buffer, right? So remember that each of these has a depth. Each pixel has a depth. Let's say this is a depth of eight. This is a depth of eight, seven, seven, six, right? So you can see it's going down as it gets closer to us. And then this is like three, 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 right? So these are drawn over those. But since the quad isn't present over here, these will get drawn first. This depth array uh, tracks where what the depth is at each pixel on the screen's buffer. Essentially, it's keeping track of the depth of every single pixel that's been drawn thus far. And if the current fragment, the current pixel that we're going to draw is behind the last pixel we draw at this particular point in the screen, then it's just going to discard it. It's not going to draw it because you don't want to draw over something, right? You don't want, uh, let's say, the house that's far away to be drawn in front of the person that's that's walking in front of it. That wouldn't make any sense. And then from there, we get the fragment color. So that's basically from the texture and we put it onto the screen. Um, there's complicated logic here to handle um, transparency. Don't need to get into it. It's not important and it's not, I mean, it's not really that complicated, honestly. That's essentially what we're doing. So now we have, you know, so if we go back here, so we, we figured out how to transform you know, 3D coordinates into the 2D screen coordinates, 2D in quotes, because there's also depth. We transform the computer's coordinates into screen coordinates for the user. We actually draw everything on the screen, on the virtual sort of, you know, on our buffer, right? And then after that, the last thing to do is send it over to the, uh, the video card. And we just do that with right frame. So all that literally all that does is just send all of the information we just put together in the in the 3D engine and sends it to the graphics uh, the graphics chip. So this is essentially what this is doing. And there's some other details. I mean, there you know you have to handle the rotation of of the screen and of the character, you know, of the of where the person's looking, all this sort of stuff. That's basically what I've got so far. And soon I'm going to need to worry about input. Uh, so we have the U keyboard controller. I'm going to need to add a mouse controller. All of our input so I can actually control the character in the game, which I can't yet. That's, uh, that's what I've been working on. Hope you enjoyed that.